Wait, is this just gate? Chapter Epilogue Written by Pepper Antique And now up next for this closed hearing is a, former, Master Chief Anthony S. Vickers of the United States Navy. And also this hearing's first um, were, person. At that Vickers walked forward from the small door that the hearing deputy was barring him from. He limped as he walked. His back had only been worked on three days prior. The hearing committee had offered to allow him to use video chat for his questioning. But he'd assured them he would be fine to show up in person. Had insisted, in fact. His service record, and more than likely the committee's curiosity, had caused them to allow it. He ignored the murmurs of the committee and the members present in the crowd. He also did everything he could to ignore how goddamned uncomfortable a three-piece suit was for someone with a body like his. Even with it being magically tailored by a few of the Petravians from the camp. Um. Good afternoon Mr. Vickers. Congressman Leo Berman said uncertainly as he studied Vickers. I understand you've recently recovered from a rather invasive surgery. You seem to be moving well are you okay to proceed today? I am sir. Vickers replied. Very well. Do you understand the nature of today's investigative hearing? The congressman asked. Yes sir. Vickers replied again. It is looking into the nature of the Petaravian and Vatrian refugee crisis and the military's involvement. Correct. And for the record, please refer to the, quote, Petravians and a, uh, Vatrians, as simply the refugees, from this point forward. Leo Berman clarified. For records purposes. Vickers pursed his lips. I'm afraid I can't do that sir. He said simply. I'm sorry, what was that Mr. Vickers? The congressman asked, clearly not used to being told no. I can't simply call them refugees sir. Vickers repeated. It's not a correct designation. Oh. Leo Berman asked. And how so? Vickers shrugged a bit. Well. He began. For starters, not all of them are Petaravian or Vatrian. He said. Some are from a society known as the Lunar Council City States. These are, almost to a person, were folk, like myself. Including a woman and commander in their military who I myself am currently engaged to. This caused the murmurs in the room to rise again as Leo Berman looked down at Vickers with raised eyebrows. Additionally, the Petaravian nation currently has a formally recognized SOFA agreement with the United States. They are our allies, per a declaration signed by the President of the United States himself. And several of their people here in our country are members of their royal family and as such should have diplomatic immunity. Additionally those few are also legal citizens of the United States due to their status as dependents of a member of our military. They even have children who are enrolled in DEERS and have dual citizen status. Leo Berman was about to speak again when Vickers continued, causing the congressman to grow irked by the frustrating man. On top of that, more than a few of the people that came through are active duty military personnel who were simply off duty at the time of the emergency that caused them to come over including several who, like myself, he gestured at his form, are not recognizable as human anymore. And how does that impact anything? The congressman asked. I if they're active duty United States military personnel then they are not refugees. Then you should tell that to the several thousand military personnel you currently have holding them and all the other, so-called, refugees in the internment camp without release. Vickers shot back because they haven't been released yet despite their info being available to the people holding them, and myself, prisoner there. More murmurs. And louder this time. That's enough. Leo Berman said as he quieted the room. This changes very little Mr. Vickers. At the end of the day we have nearly 10,000 refugees, he said the last word slowly and deliberately, making a point of pronouncing each syllable individually. In California and Montana. People who are, as you have pointed out, not all from a country with a recognized alliance with our country. And most of whom aren't even human. And? Vickers asked. Come again? Leo Berman asked, confused. I said, and? Vickers repeated. 
and, do you not see the danger in that? Course I do. Vickers replied. Leo Berman removed his glasses and made a show of wiping them as he shook his head a bit. As he put them back on he looked back down at Vickers. Vickers once again cut him off before he spoke again, causing even more frustration. But I also see the opportunity. He said with a slight smirk. Leo Berman stared at him. He himself, and every other politician in the country as well as their savvy, under the table, business partners, could also see the possibilities of the situation. But unlike them, Vickers was totally okay with saying them aloud. This world has magic now. He said. But none of you know how to use it. This world has were folk now. Especially our Russian rivals. But they only have wolves. This world has a whole ton of issues with race. Now we got entirely different species, of people. He gestured at himself once more while looking around. And the people from the other side of the gates have a ton, of experience dealing with all of that. Sure. He continued. Cutting the congressman off yet again. Irwin and the airbase were grade A fuck-ups. But we, and specifically IIII, only did what we did to save lives. And to bring more people into our country's big Ole melting pot. It's gonna cause problems. Sure. But take it from someone of both Irish and Italian heritage. Once those problems are resolved admittedly that'll probably take a while we'll be even better off for it. Leo Berman hadn't expected that angle. Or at least not exactly. And what of the resource cost of these refugees Mr. Vickers? He asked, certain the former SEAL wouldn't have a reply for that. What of the water cost? Vickers shrugged again. Then he pointed at the myriad of papers on the congressman's desk. You didn't read up on what a druid is. Did you? He asked. Thus began a rather long few days for Vickers as Congressman Leo Berman began leafing through his papers. But, he was patient. He wondered for a moment if there was any sign of Choi. Though he doubted it for some reason. Based on the reports he'd pried out of the brass, he'd be surprised if Choi was ever found. He looked up toward the sky for just a moment before the annoying politician grabbed his attention with another dumbass question. Samantha smiled as Fletcher walked into the room and sat down at the chair in front of her. He smiled too, though he was clearly uncomfortable. Then he picked up the phone on his side of the glass. You know. You'd think a lawyer would be more familiar with this. He said. But being a health insurance lawyer kinda prevents these kinds of interactions from happening. He turned from his inspection of the barrier wall and looked her in the eyes fully. But I guess it's even more awkward for a former MP. She chuckled a little bit. It's only until the hearings get over with. She said. They'll be setting bail next week. Then it's just a matter of waiting until the government decides how to handle non-human rights. Well I'll help with the first part. Fletcher said. I already talked to your dad about it. Richard you didn't ha, she began. He waved the argument away. Doing it anyways. He said. In fact you'd be surprised at how much the hospital staff, and the Sturgis community for that matter, are pulling together to get you guys out. They are? She asked. Oh yeah. He said. Hell, a few of those basketball players from the outing even reached out. They're running a fund page online for you guys. He let out a quick laugh. At the rate they're going I'd be surprised if me or your dad have to pay more than a few bucks. That actually surprised her. What about the court cases after? She asked curiously. He shrugged. We'll burn that bridge when we get to it. He replied. I've reached out to a few old college buddies of mine. A few of them have expressed interest in helping. But, you guys are kind of a hot commodity in the legal community. Every firm in the country either wants nothing to do with you. Or they're fighting tooth and nail to be the ones that got the Wonder Wolf. He wiggled his fingers at her like a magician as he said the goofy title. Out of jail. She laughed. She hated that name. Had ever since she'd first heard it. It wasn't like she still had the shield or spear or anything. Nor did she want them. 
but the name was terrible. And funny. Besides. He continued. That a, lean da, guy is apparently making some waves with his speeches to Congress. There's a good chance this will all get chalked up to being simple wolf stuff once they get some basic rights written in ink. She nodded. The old dear man had been awfully eloquent in the short time she'd gotten to know him. And he knew more about were folk than anyone in any of the refugee camps. Including the countless folk who had come over from, of all places, an entirely different world. He snapped her back out of her thoughts by wrapping his knuckles against the glass. Either way I'll be here with you. He said easily. Her tail started to wag as she unconsciously pressed her face against the glass. Driscoll sighed as he sat down at the end of his shift. He was simultaneously glad that the moon-based fuckery had ended and he could move around like normal again. It was, at least according to all the mags, nothing short of a miracle that the folk still in this world were back to normal. They weren't really. They all knew that. His senses had dulled. He could still see, hear, and smell more strongly than any human. But it wasn't as pronounced as before. That was a blessing and a curse. Handling the overload, especially in a kitchen setting, was made a lot easier. But as a former operator he couldn't deny that he would eventually end up missing the stronger versions of the senses. But the biggest difference was the weakness. The sheer physical diminishment compared to how he'd been before. Like the senses he was still stronger than any of the earth humans that were still present. But the difference wasn't as pronounced as before. And he got tired so much easier now. God how he got tired. He had been working for nearly 18 hours now. Cooking the pastries and breads, and other baked goods that he'd perfected over the past half a year or so pretty much non-stop to support the kitchen staff. The nation was in shambles. All of them were if the word on the street could be trusted. He had no reason to doubt it though. A whole moon gone. All the folk severely weakened as a result, albeit stably so. Massive portions of the planet bombarded by asteroids from the planet's rings. A crown prince in a magically induced coma as his body recovered from so many broken bones, and such severe magical overuse that his first few days back his survival had been questionable. A holy emperor, dead, leaving his nation in turmoil as his closest relatives began a religious and political war of accession. The two leaders of the Earth Embassy unavailable. Vickers because he was on Earth being interrogated about his involvement, and Choi MIA. Driscoll couldn't do anything about that. But he was on the castle's kitchen roster. So he baked and sent out carts full of baked goods for the castle staff and countless refugees being processed. Mr. Driscoll? The familiar voice of head chef Bofar asked from nearby. Driscoll looked over at him curiously. You okay? Driscoll nodded slowly as he looked back at the apron in his hands. Tired yeah? Yeah. Driscoll answered. Shifts over. Bofar responded. Want something to eat before you go grab some sleep? Driscoll looked back over at the chef. Got any uh, he tried to think of the best parallel for bratwurst. Got any of that denarian spiced sausage? He asked. Bofar nodded easily, though Driscoll could see the bags under his eyes. He'd gone without sleep even longer than Driscoll had. Show me the way. Driscoll said as he stood up and dusted off his shirt. I'll show you how to make a Chicago dog. Bofar's eyebrows knitted as Driscoll clapped him on the shoulder. We're going to eat dogs? He asked curiously. Seems barbaric. Driscoll chuckled as he saw Five and Gorner walk past the door to the dining hall. They exchanged quick nods before continuing on their ways. She and the centaur had been busy helping transport the injured for the past few weeks. Just a name. He said as he swiped a few of the buns he'd only finished making ten minutes ago. Besides. Pretty sure a fox eating a dog is technically a distant kind of cannibalism. Life hesitantly stepped up next to the new, God. Are there any left? She asked as death stood on his opposite side. The champion stood over the viewing area. His weapons were still in his hands, with the chain laying on the ground behind him. His uniform was even more tattered than before. 
and the tendrils of nothingness that trailed from the back of his head seemed to have grown longer. A few, he said quietly. Logic. Nature. Industry. Surprisingly greed. Death nodded even as he looked disgusted. That guy's a fucking worm of a god. He said to the champion. Life looked down at the viewing pool. You could, she began. No. The champion replied quickly. Life nodded understanding. She didn't understand the reasoning. But she could guess. The champion's eyes were damp with tears made of the same nothingness as the eyes themselves as he looked down. Down below the two constants watched with increasing pity for the new entity. And more than a little surprise at one of the two developments he was watching. But the small piece of James that would always be in there was weeping at the sight. Some of the tears were for the message that he saw his former exo send to his wife. The recording that he'd recorded only moments before taking to the sky to see his brother one last time. He could see through the communication setup that Greaves was using that Amina was receiving the news as well as he'd expected. Though he was glad that Greaves had already set a copy of the recording aside on a USB that she quickly set into a locked drawer. He had no doubt that someday she would give that USB to Amina so she could show their daughters once they were old enough. The other tears were of happiness. Life's head tilted as she realized why. Something had happened that shouldn't have. V. Lyri smiled as she watched Joel running through the grass alongside his cousins and best friends. They were playing a game that had existed in both universes longer than either universe's recorded history. Tag! Joel yelled as he managed to swipe at Kelsey with a lupine paw. Your IT! He yelled as he transformed back into his human form. No fair! Kelsey whined. You were using your beast shapes. Mel and T keep up just fine. Joel shot back before blowing a raspberry at his cousin. Besides you two were wind running. Can't outwolf us. Tilo retorted as he took a knee to catch his breath. He didn't want to admit that despite being almost seven years older than the other three, he and his twin sister were almost being outwolfed by the young Joel. Amina came back to the table that the three of them had set up for the play date. Yell gladly accepted a glass of wine from the former general. V. Lyri opted for a cup of coffee. Suddenly both Glag and Steve turned their heads toward the road. Steve's eyes were, as always, hollow voids that couldn't be seen into. But they somehow saw things that others couldn't. And Glag was well, he'd been different since the asteroids. He was smarter now. Though he was also quieter. Both of the mysterious creatures had changed that day. Amina, still standing, was the first to see what had caused the two of them to stir. And what she saw made her drop the tray of snacks and drinks. V. Lyri stood up and looked. And when she did, she saw someone standing in the gateway to the rebuilt Choi home. He was tall, and his hair and beard were long and ragged. He leaned a little as his hand rested on a walking stick. His clothes looked worn and dirty, but well made. And he had antlers growing from his head. Behind him was an incredibly colorful drake, who seemed to have an almost leopard-like pattern of yellow and dark purple scales, and a long, narrow, line of fur down the center of its back. It stared at Steve. But the massive and strangely empowered drake simply stared back, as passively as he ever did nowadays. But even still, her brain told her that this was impossible. Miss V. Lyrie? The man said. And the voice made her drop the cup of coffee. Mommy who's that? Joel asked from nearby. All the kids had stopped playing to see the newcomer. Joseph Choi took a shaky step through the gateway, somehow not being affected by the enchantments they'd placed on it to prevent intruders. And if anything, that only confirmed who he was. Margaret. Amina called as she began running toward the main house. Mrs. Choi. That's your father. V. Lyrie said. Joey smiled as he saw the recognition on her face. 